One of the last things you're going to learn in this course is how to set up and analyze fractional factorial designs. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about in this screencast. Fractional factorial experiments are important when full factorial designs are too large or are not necessary. So if this is the case, a fraction of the full design may be employed. This is particularly useful when we have higher order interactions that are likely to be negligible when we are screening for factors that have large effect on the measured variable. In particular, this is used early on when you're trying to screen through the important factors. We've got an example here. We have a chemical reaction, A plus B going to C. You hypothesize that there might be five things, five factors that have an effect on the reaction yield, temperature, time, pH, pressure, and concentration of substrate. Because it is likely that only one or two factors actually impact the reaction yield, we may reduce the number of essential experiments by first screening for the key factors. And so we've got a lot of factors here. We have five. We're early on in our characterization. Higher order interactions are likely to be negligible, or we are not very interested in those higher order interactions at this point. And so we're just kind of trying to screen through to eliminate the insignificant factors. This is an example of where we might want to use a fractional factorial design. Let's talk about some terminology, a half fraction design, that's when you're only carrying out half of the number of experimental treatment combinations as you would in a full factorial design. We have k factors, but only 2 to the k minus 1 runs. And that's how we refer to these as. We refer to this as 2 to the k minus 1. For example, if we had five factors, there would be 2 to the fifth or 32 runs in a full factorial design, but in a half fraction design, we only need 2 to the 5 minus 1, or 16 runs. A quarter fraction design, we have k factors, but only 2 to the k minus 2 runs. For example, if we had 8 factors, there would be 256 runs in a full factorial design. But in a quarter fraction design, we would have 2 to the 8 minus 2 equals 64 runs. In general, we define a fractional design as 2 to the k minus p. So let's revisit a full factorial design. We have 2 to the 5th. We have 32 different possible experiments or treatment combinations as shown here on the right. The sparsity of effects principle basically tells us that a system is generally dominated by the main effects and low order interactions. Three factor and higher order interactions are generally negligible. For a 2 to the 5th design, we have five degrees of freedom that correspond to main effects. 10 that correspond to two-factor interactions, and 16 degrees of freedom that correspond to three, four, and five-factor interactions. So based on this sparsity of effects principle, if we neglect the 16 higher-order interactions and use these degrees of freedom, these 16 degrees of freedom for error, it's quite easy to perform adequate statistical analysis on the main and binary effects. And this is what I've shown you in some previous screencasts. But now if we look at a 2 to the 5 minus 1 half fractional factorial design, we would have only 16 experiments or observations. We have 32 possible treatment combinations shown over here on the right. And so the question becomes, how do we decide which of these treatment combinations to actually put together and perform? For a 2 to the 5 minus 1 design with only 16 observations, that means we only have 15 degrees of freedom. We can only assign estimates, therefore, to 15 of our total 31 total effects, main, binary, ternary, quaternary, and fifth order interactions. So we basically only have half the required degrees of freedom. So how do we proceed? Somehow we have to pare down these 32 possible treatment combinations down to 16. Using the sparsity of effects principle, we can make some assumptions with respect to higher order terms. We can assume that the third, fourth, and fifth order terms are negligible. But still, even if we do that, if we neglect all the third order and higher interactions, we still don't have enough degrees of freedom for error because we have 15 main effects and two-factor interactions, and we only have 15 degrees of freedom. And so when we're statistically analyzing these fractional factorial designs, it becomes a little more complicated. So let's start out with the simplest half fraction design, 2 to the 3 minus 1. Up above here, this is a full 2 cube design, which has eight possible experiment or treatment combinations. So how do we pare down and make this a half fractional design? Which of these treatment combinations do we choose to eliminate and which do we choose to actually collect data for? If unreplicated, if n equals 1, then we'll have four observations. 
and the question becomes which four of the eight to use. One option for this two to the three minus one design is if we sort by column AB and we only retain those rows that have AB equal to one. If we did this, you notice that if we computed the contrast, the contrasts are computed by taking the dot product of these columns with the actual treatment responses. We would not be able to tell the difference between A and B, you notice that they're exactly the same, nor AC and BC, those are exactly the same, and C and ABC, those are exactly the same. So we have a problem here. This is a very poor choice since A and B, as an example, are aliased. That's a term that we're going to use quite a bit when we talk about fractional factorial designs. If the A, B effect, remember they're combined because the computation of them is exactly the same. So if that A, B effect is significant, we don't know if it's due to effect A or if it's due to effect B. Another option for the two to the three minus one design is if we sorted our eight original rows. Remember, we're starting with this full two to the three design and we're trying to decide which of these four to keep. So if we sorted by the first column when A equals one, we would retain these four treatment combinations. Here, we would not be able to tell the difference between B and AB, nor C and AC, nor BC and ABC. This is a little bit different than the previous one that I showed, since the main effects B and C are aliased with binary effects, which are generally not as significant as the main effects. So this is a little bit better, but we still have some improvements that we can make for this two to the three minus one design. And that is when we sort by the last column, ABC equals one. Again, we're starting with those eight full rows of the two to the three design, and we're trying to decide which ones to keep. If we sorted by the last column, ABC, and only kept those where ABC equals plus one, what happens here is we will not be able to tell the difference between A and BC, nor B and AC, nor C and AB. But this is a lot better because all of the main effects are aliased with binaries of the other factors. For example, A is aliased with the interaction BC. And so this is actually the best possibility for a two to the three minus one design. Now keep in mind this aliasing. Again, if we calculated the contrast for A, and BC, they're exactly the same. Generally, because of what we know about higher order interactions, main effects generally have more significance than binary interactions. So if we determined that the A slash BC effect was significant, we could probably be confident that most of that significance was due to the main effect of A and not the binary BC. Here, ABC has been chosen as the design generator. So that's something that we'll talk about quite a bit when we're talking about fractional factorial designs. I equals ABC is the design generator. If you multiply both sides of the design generator by C, you would get C equals ABC squared. Anything squared is just equal to I, which is equivalent to one. And so really what we're saying is the C column up here is equal to AB. So we're only performing those experiments where C equals the product of AB. Table 1430 in your book outlines a bunch of different fractional factorial designs. We have the number of factors, K, the fraction. We've already talked about the two to the three minus one. There's all sorts of different designs. This table shows you the number of runs and also the design generators. So that C equals AB is what I just referred to. You notice that there's plus and minus for all of these. It's typical to choose the plus option, and that's known as the principal fraction. The negative value is known as the alternate fraction. So here we chose C equals AB, but we could also choose C equals negative AB. So let's just kind of summarize what we concluded with the half fractional design, two to the three minus one. In the table, column A equals column B, and similarly, B equals AC, and C equals AB and ABC equals I. We can thus say that A and BC are aliases as are B and AC and C and AB, as I discussed earlier. As a result, the effects of A and BC cannot be differentiated using this design and same with the other equalities. Again, typically 
binary interactions like BC are significantly less than main effects. And so if we are getting a significant effect due to the combination of A and BC, it's likely that most of that is caused by the main effect of A. Also, whenever we have a column equal to I, like ABC equals I, we cannot determine the effect for that column. In order to determine effects, you have to be able to calculate the contrast, and the contrast you need both positive and negative values. So if we have all ones in a column, that means we cannot calculate the contrast nor effect of that particular interaction. So for this design, we cannot determine the ternary effect ABC. So what's gained in a half fractional design? You only have to run four experiments to identify likely important main effects. So if these experiments are very expensive, maybe you're having to test something for weeks just to get one replicate, then a half fractional design might be a good idea. What's lost? The ability to distinguish main and binary effects is lost. In other words, we lose resolution in elucidating the effects. So there's kind of a trade-off. Less money, less time, but you're not able to distinguish between the main and binary effects quite as much.